Good morning. How is everyone? <laughs> yeah, I know the voice is a little deeper. Sorry about that. Uh, well, again, it's a beautiful day to, uh, to gather in the Lord's house. And again, uh, tomorrow, of course, we will celebrate uh, definitely a, 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 a wonderful day of, uh, of celebration uh, for those that, of course, paid the ultimate sacrifice. John fifteen thirteen says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Uh, all of us uh, have veterans in our, in our life, uh, those who probably lost uh, friends and, uh, you know, so many people that, that just paid that ultimate sacrifice uh, just, you know, to, to allow us uh, to have our freedoms in this country. And uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful day, again, to honor those uh, that we no longer have. Uh, if everyone would, if you would stand with us today. We're going to start out with Come Now is the Time to Worship. see someone that uh, you don't know or somebody you hadn't seen in a while, go ahead and shake their hand. seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Fredonia Baptist Church. Glad that you're here to worship with us today. It's a beautiful weekend. I'm glad you chose to spend the Lord's Day in the Lord's house with the Lord's people. If you're a guest visiting with us, we're glad that you're here to worship with us. Feel free to stop by in the foyer after service today. I'd love to talk to you, talk to you about ways you can be involved here in our church family. So a couple of announcements today. We have some very important dates that are coming up on the calendar. If you're going to Journey Camp, your total cost is due today. Today the final payment is due. If you need to know how much you owe, just let me know. VBS registration is underway. VBS is only a couple days away. If you or your child, there are, you're serving or your child is going to plan to attend and you have not registered them yet, please go ahead and do so. It makes our lives, makes Drew's life, anybody who's involved in admin makes their lives a lot easier. Helps the first day of VBS to flow a lot better. So go ahead and register your kids. If you register before May 31st, they get a free t-shirt. Everybody likes a free t-shirt. So if you want your free t-shirt, make sure that you are registered before then. This Wednesday, we will not have Bible study on campus. We will have BBS Blitz. We're going to go out into the community, go out into all the neighborhoods that are surrounding the church in a couple mile radius, and we're going to invite the kids to Vacation Bible School. 
directory photos. If you purchased one and you'd like to order some, the information about that is in the bulletin. We will have no Sunday school next week on June the 4th. June 4th is going to be a busy Sunday, but we will have no Sunday school. We're going to have a VBS commissioning service. We're going to spend time praying over our teachers, praying for our kids, and remember that we will not have Sunday school next week. We will have regular worship at 10 o'clock. Next Sunday evening, starting at 5 o'clock, we'll have our VBS kickoff. We're going to do an OMC. We'll have wet water slides, water guns, shaving cream, all the fun stuff. Come at 5 o'clock, and you'll get a free hot dog. Kindergarten and college recognition forms are going to also be next Sunday, and those forms are due today. If you need one, you can pick that up off the table in the foyer and turn that in to me or to Madison. Since your kid payment is due next Sunday, and today is the last day to give to our month of giving for May, which is the Baptist Children's Village. Now, I know I said a lot in just a few moments, but we're glad that you're here to worship with us. I know it's Memorial Day weekend. We have a lot of things to be thankful for. If you lost a loved one, in service, uh, I pray that God would comfort you this weekend and that we're thankful for their service. And I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to continue with our service this morning. Father, we're thankful for who you are. Lord, we're thankful that you love us. Lord, we're thankful that you provide men and women to serve for our country, to give us the freedoms that we have. Lord, the, the freedom that we're most thankful for is to be able to worship today. Lord, I pray that you'd be honored as we open up your word today. I pray that you would give Brother Nathan the words to say. And, Lord, that you'd be glorified above it all. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If everyone would stand to sing with us. Our Lord of creation and Lord of my life. Lord of the land and the sea day of remembrance, as Hunter was saying, as we honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice, a lot of times as life gets busy, it's very, very easy to forget 
those that sacrificed for us. A lot of times it's, it's easy to forget and get caught up in the, in the busyness of life and forget the ultimate sacrifice that our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ, made for each and every one of us in here so that we can have eternal life. message behind this song, folks. And as Christians, we all should be raising that hallelujah. Give praise to our Lord and Savior. Echo these words again with the choir as we go along. Sing a little louder. 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 Let's sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. 
wonderful is that as Christians to know that death is defeated to those we've said goodbye to that it is only temporary that we will see them one day again Good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that uh, I'm able to be here with you. I think I scared some of your leaders a little earlier. Just a little bit. Do y'all think I forgot? Well, my name's Nathan, and um, my family is back here. Jessica and Height and Walls and Malachi. DL is not here. DL's a year and a half old, and that's exactly why he's not here. But I'm so thankful for the opportunity to come and, and be with you this morning. I'm thankful for Jeremy and his friendship. Um, he, so Walls and Tanner have uh, played soccer and baseball and different things, go to school together, boys go to, to Ingmar, and they've enjoyed that and enjoyed getting to hang out together. And, uh, and I'm uh, helping uh, Jeremy as coaching Walls in baseball this year. And that's been one of those things. I'm, I coach T-ball, and I help Jeremy. I basically, you know, cat herder. I get them all in line, the batting order and everything. But uh, coaching T-ball and hanging out at the baseball field, it's one of those things you have to remind yourself that you will interact with everybody here, like outside of this. And so they need to think well of you once this is done. So that kind of helps with, you know, your attitude and remembering that these are five- and six-year-olds playing T-ball. And it's, it's going to be okay. Well, I'm thankful to be here this morning, thankful to be a part of your worship service. So I'm the chaplain for the hospital here in New Albany um, and Boonville. So um, I, I work with some of you, so it's good to see you. I'll see you again. I have to remind myself I'll see some of you tomorrow morning. That'll be good. Looking forward to that. But I want to share a little, little story with you. And you can turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. I want to, if you'll bear with me just for a moment, I want to share a story with you while you're finding your place there. And I also want you to know, I fully realize that this is, uh, some things in this story may bring some emotions out in you, and that's okay. I'm going to do that um, with gentleness and kindness this morning, and so any any emotions that it may bring up, and it'll be all right, and we'll, we'll work through it. The emergency department of any hospital can be one of the most intimidating and chaotic places. Now, certainly, there are plenty of routine viruses and broken bones, as many of you know, and there's also more than enough traumatic cases to go around. And I've come to describe emergency department nurses as an equal mixture of Mother Teresa and an MMA fighter. And both seem to be useful often enough. And so I want to paint a picture for you. And again, it's very likely that some of you have found um, yourself in these situations before. But here we go. So the ambulance rushes the patient through a fluorescent lit hallway into a waiting trauma room that's prepped and it's ready for whatever unknowing tragedy has happened. Now at this point, there's usually only one or two people that's come in with the patient, maybe a spouse, family member, or a friend. The tensions are high. The medical staff allows their training to take over. Instructions are being called out and everyone works as a team to sustain a life that's slipping away. By now, the spouse, family, friends have started making the call. And you know the call. 
It's the one that no one ever wants to receive. It's the one that tells you that your worst fear has come true. And in the midst of the chaos, the staff have called me. And my job is to be the non-anxious presence in the middle of a fear-striking circumstance. And I have the opportunity to comfort anyone that's standing by, watching, hoping, and praying that this is not the end. Inevitably, there are times when the team has done all that they can do, but the precious life has passed away on from this world. Now my work really begins. I I provide as much comfort and presence as I can in the midst of sobbing, making more phone calls, trying to make sense out of what has just happened. There are no words, to be sure, that can bring comfort in a moment like this. Nothing's going to make this okay. But this is an experience that many will go through. Many of you have been through it, and you will go through it. But for me, I want to make sure that no one goes through it alone. By now, more family has arrived. Pastors, spiritual mentors, and more friends are gathering in the family waiting room. And this is, as strange as it may sound, this is the beauty of this moment. Because it's at this point that I begin to fade into the background of the emergency department, and I begin my work with the staff, because they are my community, and they need to be cared for now. So for the family, their community has come to care for them. The community is the gift that God has given us. I want you to listen to some of the ways that Paul describes some of his letters in the New Testament about the community. Bear with each other. Forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. So there should be no division in the body, but, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, then every part rejoices. In Ephesians chapter 4, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The community is important. God has given you each other. So look around right now at each other. This is your community. This is the gift that God has given you. Now, I know... Look, my dad is a pastor. I grew up, I mean, I was in a Baptist church nine months before I was born. I know there are moments when this doesn't feel like a gift. The person sitting on the other side of the aisle doesn't feel much like a gift. But the reality is, is that God has given you each other to partner with Him in bringing His kingdom to this earth until He returns. That's the job. That's the calling. That's why you are sitting in this seat this morning. The part of this kingdom that we get to partner with Him in is realizing the new humanity. And that's what Paul, the picture that Paul's painting for us in the book of Ephesians. So we can think of the book of Ephesians like this. It's a community's guide for comprehending and responding to the revelation of the crucified and risen King. Now, I was going to say we, we can't go through all the book of Ephesians. We could you would be pretty unhappy with me if we went through the whole book this morning. So we'll just stick to the first couple of verses. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful this morning for the opportunity to gather around Your Word with the community, this new humanity, Lord, that You have brought together through the blood of Jesus. That You've invited us to 
receive Christ by faith, and Lord, we were born into a new family. And for better or worse, Lord, this is it. But God, I'm thankful for it because it is exactly this community that you've blessed us with to, to care for ourselves, to care for one another, to, to be on mission in this world, to, to provide healing and comfort and peace and rest to others who need it. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd be with us this morning, Lord, that you would transform our hearts by the renewing of our minds through your holy word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we can think of the book of Ephesians. Really, what I hope to do in just a few moments this morning is, is just to give you a little, a little taste of what Paul is doing in Ephesians. And I hope that it would spur you on to spend some time in it um, with your family, by yourself, or together as this community. So let, let's, let's go. Here we go. Verse 1. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus. Now, most of our copies of Scripture probably say that, that phrase, to the saints. And, and it's not wrong, but it really doesn't give us the best picture of what Paul is writing. It doesn't give us the most full picture of what's going on. Holiness is first and foremost an attribute of God. It describes Him. It's His character. It's who God is and how He acts in this world toward us and, and toward His creation. It's a, a one-of-a-kind otherness. It's, it's by virtue belongs to Him because He's the Creator. Isaiah chapter 6, it, it paints for us this, this image of God as being high and lifted up above everyone else on, on His heavenly throne. In the whole of Scripture, there are two groups that get to hold the image of God and retain the status as the Holy Ones. Everybody say, Holy One. That's really what Paul is saying when he says, to the saints. The better way to describe that word or, or to translate that word is to the Holy Ones. There are only two groups in, in the whole of Scripture that get to claim that status. God partnered with pe the people of Israel in the Old Testament, and He called them a holy nation in Exodus chapter 19. And so when they're faithful to the covenant and have access to God's presence in the temple, they become holy ones. When they did the things that God told them to do, they became the holy ones. The next group are the spiritual beings. You can think the way the, the Bible describes it in Genesis 2 as the host of heaven. Psalm 89 describes it like this. The heavens will praise your wonders, Yahweh, even your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. So here in Ephesians, Paul is assigning this same language of God's divine heavenly counsel to those who trust in Christ. So if you are a part of those who have professed this believing loyalty that Jesus Christ is who He claims to be, you are a holy one. There's a couple of times this morning that we'll have what I'll call mirror moments. And this is one of them. As I've come to the realization that my hair is turning gray. Now I find myself... Every time that I look into the mirror doing what? Looking for new ones. Looking for new troops that have joined the, the reign of the gray army that's encroaching across my hairline. Any new signs of my mortality? And this is what we all tend to do when we look into the mirror, isn't it? I mean, how many of us this morning when you got up and, and you got, you're getting ready before you took a shower or brushed your teeth or whatever, you looked into the mirror and you think, all right. Probably not many of us. So I want to ask you this morning, do you see yourself as a holy one? Do you see yourself as a holy one? Because what I think happens a lot of times is we allow our pain and guilt and shame and may, maybe the weight of what we've been through to outweigh what God has done for us in our salvation. 
I want you to hear me very clearly this morning. What you are saved into is much more important than what you are saved from. Does that resonate with anybody? Because i got to be honest. There are, there are mo- probably most of the time, I don't feel much like a holy one. What's the message that you are giving yourself in relationship to how you view your salvation in Christ? Because this is how the Bible describes you. If you have professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and, and God has redeemed you from, uh, from your spiritual death, and He has made you alive in Jesus, He has given you new breath in your lungs, you are a holy one, whether you feel like it or not. And it's really important in, in, in relation to, to how we view ourselves and, and what we do. I mean, if you, if you feel like the weight and the guilt of your past life is still weighing you down, then you're not going to be able to live in the freedom that Jesus has given you. And we need to understand the freedom that we have in Jesus. And so when you look in the mirror tonight or in the morning, when you get ready to start your week or you get tomorrow off, You're looking into the eyes of a holy one. The purpose of this community, of the community of the holy ones, is to partner with God to understand and respond to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Who He is and what He's come to do in this world. You are here for a reason. You individually and then you all corporately are here for a reason. One of my favorite authors and, and just people in general is a man named Viktor Frankl, and you've probably heard that name before. He was a Jewish psychiatrist who was put into a series of concentration camps uh, by Hitler's Nazi regime, and he endured many hardships and struggles, none of which was more difficult than finding purpose in what seemed like an impossible situation. And even though there came a time when he determined that he would never get outside those prison walls again, he found purpose. He went to work doing what he was created to do. And so he, he began to observe how his fellow prisoners were able to endure horror and pass, uh, pass through that horror while, uh, while others were not. And the difference was what he determined to be meaning. Why am I here? What's the purpose of, of my life? What's the point of me being here doing what I'm doing? And so to live for meaning means not that you try to get something out of life, but rather that life expects something from you. The grace that you've been given, in chapter 2, Paul is going to say, it is by grace that you've been saved. That grace is given to you freely, but it's given to you with an expectation that you're going to respond to it. That there's going to be a response to the grace that God has given you, accepting the invitation to follow Him as the Lord and the Savior of your life, but to respond in service, to give others what God has given you. Tim Keller, who recently passed away after his battle with cancer, commenting on this, wrote, In other words, you have meaning only when there is something in life more important than your own personal freedom and happiness. Something for which you are glad to sacrifice your happiness. Is there something in your life, is there something that God has called you to do that, you, that, that gives you meaning, that gives you purpose, that, that gets you out of bed in the morning? And, and, and more than that, because I, I, I don't relate to like the, 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 people that, the people that just get up every day and they're like, man, I, I, uh, this, is, this is why I'm here. I know that this is exactly what God's called me to do. I don't really relate to that. I mean, right now, I'm a chaplain at the hospital. I mean, I feel like for this season, this is what God's called me to do. But, you know, I'm going to be honest, like most days, it doesn't feel like the reason I have breath in my lungs. I don't know, maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but, but I'm doing that for right now, and maybe that'll change. Maybe God will call me into something else. But, um, but I don't know if you relate to like those, those feelings, those emotions, if you're that kind of person that you, just, you don't ever have to be pumped up, that you just have this natural motivation to go and do whatever it is that God's called you to do. But I just think, probably for most people, that's not the reality. And so for, for Viktor Frankl, he used the gifts and the talents and abilities that he had and the circumstances in which he lived. 
And he did it for the glory of God and for the good of those who were around him. He wrote this, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's own attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And how exciting is that? That you are a holy one. That is your condition before the Father. It's who you are. God is, He has miraculously redeemed you and breathed His breath into your lungs. You are a holy one before the throne of God. And so now, you get to go use your imagine, imagination, your gifts and your talents and abilities to go serve this world until Jesus comes back. And this community, individually, and this community corporately, you get to do that. That's, that's where you find your purpose. So whatever job that you have, go do that at your job. Or whatever job you don't have, stay-at-home mom or retired or whatever it is, that's your opportunity to go and do what God has called us to do with a new community. It's bringing about the revelation of Jesus Christ until He comes back. If you'll turn over to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. This is kind of the the 30,000 foot view of why Paul wrote this book. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. One of the things that Paul is really bad at, he would get an F in English. He's terrible grammar. There are just like everything is one huge run on sentence in Ephesians. And so we're having to pick up halfway through one of Paul's run on sentences. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written it briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has been now revealed to His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I want you to picture it. It's the late 90s. If you weren't alive then, this probably won't mean much to you. It's the late 90s. It's Saturday night. If you grew up in Pontotoc like I did, you did what you did every weekend. You went to movie gallery. And you walked those aisles. You had the pictures on the boxes. If you had to go to Tupelo and Blockbuster, you just had to guess of what the picture on the box looked like. If you don't know what a video store is, um, you can Google it later. But you're looking for your night's worth of entertainment. And if you're at Movie Gallery in Pontotoc, like I probably was, you might have come around the corner to the new release section. And you saw Bruce Willis's face on a yellow and orange black cover with the words Armageddon emblazoned on the cover. And if you turn that movie on, you watched it, you might have heard something like this. After discovering that an asteroid the size of Texas will impact Earth in less than a month, NASA recruits a misfit team of deep core drillers to save the planet. What comes to your mind? What comes to your mind when I say the word apocalypse? What comes to your mind? Probably like the end of the world, right? end of the world, fire, brimstone, I don't know, whatever you imagine that being. That's what the word that we see in Revelation chapter 3, it literally means to reveal. The word apocalypse means to uncover something, to pull a blanket off something, to reveal what was once hidden under something, now you're revealing what it was. That's what the word apocalypse means. If you need a metaphor, it's revealing new truth, illuminating something. It's like when you walk into um, a dark room and you turn the light on, you have apocalypsed that room and whatever's in that room. This is what Paul is saying in Ephesians. The mystery that's been revealed. He's saying that it's the apocalypse of what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Tim Mackey from the Bible Project says this. He says, Ephesians is an essay summarizing the most important apocalyptic event in history. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and the gift of the Spirit to bring new creation right here in the present world. 
So Paul is saying that this new community, that you individually and you all as a community, that's why you're here. It's to bring about the revelation of Jesus Christ to this community, to your neighbors, to wherever you work, to your family. That's why you're here. To use the gifts and talents and abilities that God has given you to reveal the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone around you. That's the job. And so if you're struggling with that making meaning in your life, or why am I here, or what's the point of me being here, then latch on to that. And then go do whatever it is that you do for that purpose of helping people see that Jesus has come to reveal that there is a new way of life, there is a new way of being through the gospel. That's it. Now, there are a lot of details that Paul deals with and how to do that at work and how to do that through your family, how to, how to raise your children, how to love your spouse, how to fight spiritual battles through prayer, how to do all of those things. And, and those details are important, but, uh, but those are the details that you can work out with your pastor and your, and your Sunday school teacher and, and the people that mean a lot to you in your life. But that's the purpose is living that out in this world. It's the purpose for unity. The Gentiles have now been grafted into the family, into the covenant family. It's the heartbeat of this book is unity. Now, I don't know anything about your church other than who your pastor is, and I know some of you from outside, from work and different things. I, have no, I know nothing about this community how you relate to one another and how you make decisions and how you see the purpose and how you use your money, how you use these classrooms and this facility for the glory of God. I know nothing. That's for you to work out. But the purpose of this building, the purpose of every per person sitting in this room and the ones who aren't here today is for unity. Unity in, in, in ethnicity, unity in politics, unity in marriage and family, unity in work, and, and all the things, fill in the blank. There's a million different things that you, you and I need to be unified in through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is trying to tell us how to do that. Because here's the reality. If we can, if we can rest firmly on the purpose that we're here, is for the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we can work everything else out as we go. That's the most important thing, is the gospel. So it's an apocalypse. It's when the bond of, of, between heaven and earth becomes visible to you. Paul wants to recreate this apocalypse, this revelation for the people who read the book of Ephesians. And you're invited to experience the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's an invitation. Everything in the gospel is invitational. You're invited to do this, but know this, that you can, experience, you can experience oneness with Christ, maturity in your salvation and your faith. You're not, going, you're not going to experience this personal relationship with Jesus without this. It's invitational for sure. You're invited to do it. But maturity in Christ only comes when we accept that invitation. It's going to be difficult to understand things that happen in this world. It can seem at times that things are random and at other times when things are purposeful, why things happen the way they do. But we're invited to view the world through the lens of Jesus being seated in the heavenly realms above the earthly powers that cause struggle and pain and heartache. And we're invited to see the world through the lens of the resurrected Christ who holds all power and dominion both now and forever. That's our lens by which we view the world. So here's our opportunity. I want to end with this story. I love this story. I want to introduce you to two men. Friedrich von Bottelschwink. It's a crazy name, isn't it? His son was um, Friedrich von Bottelschwink Jr. They weren't very creative. They were both Lutheran ministers, and they started, uh, they started in, in Germany what was called the Bethel Institute. It served a lot of different purposes. It was mainly a hospital and psychiatric facility, but it also um, was a community. More on that in a moment. 
But Fritz Jr. took over for his father after he died, and, and he would quickly face immense difficulties in the near future because Hitler's Third Reich government would quickly take over um, implementing their own plan to create a pure people. And that was a problem for the Bethel Institute because the people that they cared for were mentally and physically, uh, they were sick and they were challenged. It was the kind of people that, um, that didn't last long under Hitler's uh, reign. And so they came uh, and confronted Fritz one day, and he said this, You can put me into a concentration camp if you want. That's your affair. But as long as I am free, you don't touch one of my patients. I cannot change to fit the times or the wishes of the Fuhrer. I stand under orders from our Lord Jesus Christ. Eric Metaxas wrote a book um, about Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and it's a, it's a wonderful book about his ministry and his life. Um, and all the things that he did. But, um, but Bonhoeffer saw the Bethel Institute, and this is how he described it. It's one of the great ministers um, who rejected, and he stood right along beside Fritz. He observed um, what Fritz and his father had started. Um, this is what he recognized. Bethel the Institute began in 1867 as a com Christian community for people with epilepsy but by 1900 included several facilities that cared for 1,600 physically and mentally disabled persons. Friedrich Jr. took it over after his father's death in 1910, and by the 1930s, it was a whole town with schools, churches, farms, factories, shops, and housing for patients, nurses, and caregivers. And at the very center were numerous hospitals and care facilities, including orphanages. Bonhoeffer saw Bethel as the antithesis of the Nazi worldview and exalted power and strength. It was the gospel made visible. Listen to this. A fairy tale landscape of grace where the physically and mentally disabled were cared for in a palpably Christian atmosphere. A fairy tale landscape of grace. This is why you are here in this community. It's to create this fairy tale landscape of grace so that the broken, the physically hurt, the spiritually broken, those that need healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, those who need the gospel can find a fairy tale landscape of grace right here. When they walk in, they see something palpably different. They know that whatever it is that they walked into is different than what they experienced out in this world. So are you creating that? Are you using your gifts and talents and abilities to create this little landscape of grace for people to find Christ, for people to find healing and nurture and all the things that they're never going to get out in this world? And here's something I hear all the time is complaints about how bad this world is getting. So what are you doing to create a landscape of grace right here that pushes back against all the nonsense that's out in this world? You don't have the right to complain about how bad the world is if you're not working to create create a, a landscape of grace right here in this building, in this community, because this is what God has called you to. This is what you and I are partnering together with for the glory of God and for the good of the people who are in this community. So create a landscape of grace right here, and wherever you and I are, whether it's on the t-ball field, or whether it's in Ingemar High School, or the hospital, or wherever we find ourselves, and when we step foot on that ground, it becomes this fairy tale landscape of grace where people can find the healing, spiritual, physical, and emotional healing that they need that only Jesus Christ can give them. Do you think you can find purpose in a life like that? I certainly do. I certainly do. And I want to encourage you to create a fairy tale landscape of grace from the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and for the good of the others right here. As I pray, I'm going to invite Hunter to come up and, uh, and the worship team as they lead us in a time of response. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace. God, that you, through the blood of Christ, through the finished work of Jesus, have made us 
holy ones, those who have a believing loyalty in Jesus, we are a holy one. That's who we are before you. There's no more work that needs to be done to, to fix our past or to cover up sins. But the, the, the Scripture says that you have removed our sin uh, from us as far as the east is from the west. And so my prayer is if there's anyone this morning that, God, if they haven't experienced that freedom, that you would draw them to yourself Draw them through the, the power of the Spirit to, to seek forgiveness, to repent and to seek forgiveness and wholeness and freedom in Christ. But Lord, I pray for those who have that believing loyalty, that they have received Jesus, but Lord, they're allowing their past to weigh them down and to keep them from moving forward in the freedom. Lord, I pray that you would show them how you see them. You see them as fearfully and wonderfully made. You see them as a holy one. You see the beauty of a creation that was created in your very own image. Let them see that this morning. And Lord, I pray for this community. I pray for Jeremy. I pray for the, the leaders of this church. I pray for the people who make up this community. That they would be about the work of revealing the gospel of Jesus Christ to this community. That they would take that meaning, that purpose on for your glory and for the good of those who are around them. Lord, I pray that they would experience the love and the peace and the joy that comes from knowing Christ. And that they would create a little landscape of grace right here where people can find what they really need in you. And so we give you this time, Father, and we ask that you would draw us to a time of response. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Brother Nathan, for the challenge and for the encouragement this morning. I want you to look around and be thankful for the community that God has gifted you with. I know that I'm thankful for it, and I hope that you are as well. Be reminded that we won't have any evening services tonight. So Wednesday will be our VBS Blitz. We'll hope that you'll come and be a part, and we will not have Sunday school next Sunday. I hope that you enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. It's a beautiful weekend, a beautiful day. Hope that you spend some time with family and reflect on the community that God has given you. Mike Nobles, will you close us in prayer?